If you're an entrepreneur, you've taken big risks, created many jobs, and devoted yourself to your business. When it comes to building your succession and transition plan, who should be involved? What are the steps along the way? Welcome to Finish Big, the podcast with Mark Dorman, sponsored by Succession Plus, inspired by the book, Finish Big, How Great Entrepreneurs Exit Their Companies on Top, by the noted entrepreneurial author, Bo Burlingham. In this podcast, we share success stories along with our expertise and knowledge about what will probably be the largest financial transaction of your life. Now, on to the show. Good day. This is Mark Dorman, your host of the Finish Big Podcast. And today I have a special guest, Mike Catan. Let me tell you a bit about Mike. This is going to be a terrific show, so we've got a lot of ground to cover. But Mike Catan is the former CEO of Pat Catan's uh, and Darice Incorporated. That's D-A-R-I-C-E. Darice was a premier wholesaler distributor with Pat Catan's. Pat Catan's was a 35-location retail store. And combined, they had over 2,500 employees, so a true middle market company. Mike has been passionate about supporting not only his community, but achievement centers for children for many, many years with a particular affinity for Camp Cheerful. Mike's interest outside of business include his restaurant, Square 22 in Strongsville, as well as multiple commercial and residential development projects under the umbrella of the Cameron Alley Group, and we'll talk about that. Mike Catan and his wife, Lori, have been married for 46 years. They live in Strongsville, Ohio, and they have been a a strong, super strong supporters of their community. Uh, In their personal life, they enjoy spending time with their four boys and 10 grandchildren. Mike Catan, welcome to Finish Big, the podcast. Well, thanks for having me, Mark. Look forward to it. Yeah, this is going to be fun. So, Mike, we're both Northeast Ohio natives I remember when I was a kid growing up in Parma, Ohio, and my mom used to drag me in to Pat Catan's, kicking and screaming with my brother, Andrew. Can you imagine two young boys in a craft store? We'd either pull everything off the shelf uh, and drive her crazy, or we couldn't wait to get home and play with our friends. But I want to go back to the very beginning of Pat Catan's. Your dad, obviously, Patrick Catan's right, shortened to Catan for business purposes, Walk us to the beginning of that entire family journey, if you would, please. First of all, I was very fortunate to have my parents. They were in that generation, the Depression generation. My dad was actually a flight instructor in World War II. He was one of very few people that had his flying license. So they recruited all these guys and made them instructors. He then ended up after the war in Cleveland to work at NASA, and he was just always a worker. And he said that pace was too slow. (laughs) He was walking downtown one day through downtown, and he noticed the guys doing the work in some of the windows of the department stores. And that's how he thought there may be a niche for some of the type of products that, that he wanted to offer. So in 1954... With $200 and two kids, he started his craft journey. He started his craft journey, but was your mom a crafter at the time? I mean, what was the attraction to getting into the crafting business? Neither one was a crafter, and that's why I bring up my dad was a pilot. He was a typical, that generation. She spent all day taking care of the kids and praying for whatever you needed. When my mom got older in life, even when she became sickly, I told the kids, just make something up for grandma to pray about, because that's when she's the happiest. But my dad, it was survival. I mean, they had no money. He was the oldest of seven kids. And he's trying to figure out what business would he get into. And he figured it out from that point. Wow. So 1954, at the onset, you're a few years older than me. I imagine you were a young boy at that time? No, I was born in 1956. So okay, 56. funny thing, he only had the two, my older brother and sister. And then in 1956, he's two years into his company, he had me and my twin sister. My mom did not drive till we were 14 years old, me and my twin sister. So it was dedication to the business. And really, if you look, what makes a lot of these successful entrepreneurs, you know, the gentleman side of it, 
is the wife giving them the ability to do that by mm-hmm. running the household that whatever else needs to be done. Yeah. Or in today's day and age, right? I mean, it can be having a non-working spouse, right? It could be the the female entrepreneur and the stay-at-home dad, not as usual typically, yeah. historically. But so where was that first store? And and I'm assuming this was a small retail outlet at the time? Correct. That was on Colburn Avenue, which is in, on the west side of Cleveland. It was approximately 600 square feet, which is the size of your family room now in most homes. Mm-hmm. And was there, is that near where you lived at the time when you were kids? Correct. We lived right off of Dennis. Okay. And when we were probably 10 or 11 years old, we moved into Middleburg Heights, which was out in the middle of nowhere at that time. Oh yeah. I can relate to that. So, so you, you're there working on the near West side of Cleveland and did your dad just jump full time into working at the retail store or did he, I mean, did he kind of phase in or was it a, just a blind leap of faith? No, he did. He quit NASA, took his $200, started buying and selling with no savings. It's really an unbelievable story, but it's not just him. That was a lot of that generation. Yeah, definitely. Definitely the greatest generation, right? That's what they say. So so that was 1954. So walk us and our listeners, Mike, and I really appreciate you joining us today, but walk us through timeline in the retail space, if you would? I mean, how long before the second store was open, the fifth store, et cetera? So the first store was 1954-ish. The second store was in Strongsville, probably 1965. And then in those next five to 10 years, he added another, we added another 10 or 12 stores. We finished with 35 stores when we sold in 2000. 16. And the two th- and the 35 stores over the years, uh, your footprint, if I recall, Michigan, Ohio, uh, Western PA, is that right? And West Virginia. In West Virginia. Okay. I'm just curious, walk us through the strategy. What types of communities were you looking to put stores in? I mean, obviously certain communities are more apt to have crafting families or crafting parents, women, men, et cetera. Was there a certain demographic that you were looking at? It it was a middle-class neighborhoods we looked into, always trying to find opportunities with the shopping centers. We would look for opportunities with the shopping center that lost their anchor tenant and something we could come in and build out. And we drew a lot of traffic in some of our newer stores because we had 35, 40,000 square feet or bigger, Mm. which would then vitalize the center then obviously turn that into a much more attractive investment. Yeah. But you imagine if they lost their anchor tenant, if that was one of your kind of go to market strategies, you were probably able to score some pretty good deals on the real estate once until you got stabilized and up and running, right? Yeah, that's correct. The advantage we had on the retail side is we were truly a destination store. And what I mean by that, you weren't just driving around looking for a bag of beads or a pom pom or a chenille stem. <laughs> You know, you knew you wanted that product. So if we were off the beaten path a little bit, it really didn't matter. We I didn't need an A-plus location. Right, right. So by 2016, you had 35 retail crafting stores under the, flat, under the name Pat Catans. But while that was, you know, kind of a burgeoning business in and of itself, you then got into the sourcing business, correct? Correct. In what year did you start the sourcing business? And the name Doris, what's the significance of that? So back in the early to mid-70s, there really was no craft industry. You had no, in today's giants, you had no Michaels, no, no Joann's, no Hobby Lobby. None of the big box stores carried crafts. So we were just early and unique in our industry. And a lot of small were businesses, even a guy with a hardware business or a plumbing business back when the mom and pops would reach out to us and say, well, I think I can sell some of your product. How do I buy it? We were actually pushed into the wholesale business, not pushed, but we were inclined to do it because we had so many individuals that were searching for where do they get this product. So in the mid seventies, we came, my dad came up with the name Doris. He always named something either after a saint or one of his family members. 
Derice was my older brother's name was Dave. And my sister's name was Patrice. So that's where the name Derice evolved to. And so in the 70s, while you probably got maybe 12, 15 stores or less, he comes up with this crazy idea and says, let's get into the wholesale distribution business. But that evolved and really became a bit of a tiger by the tail, right? It was not only the distribution, but evolved into one of the top global sourcing businesses in the U.S. Is that fair to say? No, that's correct. Derice was the largest wholesale distributor of craft products in the United States. What we did there, we were sourcing out of China, Vietnam, India, back in the late 70s, early 80s, where no one really played in that game. The reach kept growing. The challenge as we grew the business, it was hard to open new stores because then we were starting to get complaints that we were competing with our wholesale customers. We, we would get complaints from Walmart, Joanne's, Michael's. How can you open a store here? And, you know, our cover story was that's how we started. It gives us an advantage of understanding what product sells. It was a challenge, but it was what made us. Kind of, hey, why are you cannibalizing my business if I'm a good wholesale customer of yours, right? Get, go play somewhere else. Yeah, right. but you did have some, I mean, you just, at this time, Pack of Tans, the retail craft store, again, Indiana, Pennsylvania, West Virginia, Ohio. So it's kind of as long as you stayed in that, in your own playground or in your own yard, were you fairly left alone or did you still get some pushback there? We got pushback every time a major customer had a change of leadership or management at the top. We would get calls from the CEO of Michaels, the CEO of Walmart, you know, I understand you guys are good vendors, but why should I buy from you? And again, our answer was, look, we're not actively growing our retail stores. We use them as test, test pod to find out what's selling, what's not selling, which benefits you, us, and the industry. So probably in, we, we really focused from 2000 on or the mid-90s on, we focused on growing the Doris brand and we're very cautious where we opened our retail stores and sometimes too cautious because we picked a D plus location or a C minus location because while Walmart wouldn't be mad or Michaels wouldn't be mad or Joanne's wouldn't be mad. Sounds kind of crazy, but that's how we maneuvered it. Hi, this is Mark Dorman. Sorry for the interruption. I know you're listening to the Finish Big Podcast, and I'm excited to have you here. If in the event you have any questions, please head over to www.succession.plus backslash US and where you can find out how to reach me. I'd love to hear from you. And now back to the show. All right. So our guest today, ladies and gentlemen, is Mike Catan, who is the former CEO of Pat Catan's, a 35-store retail craft outlet in Doris Incorporated, which was the largest craft sourcing business in the country. Both business verticals were sold in 2016, and we'll get to that in a minute. The last question I have here is talk to us about the transition. Was there a defining moment? And then I really want to get into working in a multi-generational family business. And I know the dynamics you and I have shared over the years, but really want to get some insight from you there. But what was there a fork in the road where the family your brother, your sister, yourself, your leadership team said, enough's enough? Or is it like in some of those movies, you know, they made you an offer you couldn't refuse? It, it okay. was the latter. The business wasn't for sale. You know, we were approached by the same company every month over and over again. And finally, I decided, well, let's go down and talk to them. Let's see what's going on. And it was just at that point, selling the business was an opportunity I don't think we could have passed up. You know, this is the Finish Big podcast. I mean, is all about sharing knowledge and talking about how great entrepreneurs such as yourself, you know, finish on top. But that's not always the case, as you know. Can you share with other business owners and their advisors who might be listening to today's episode the process that you went through? I mean, how, we always try to teach our clients, hey, you always need to run your business like you're going to sell it tomorrow. <laughs> Easier said than done, as you you would agree. But Mike, I had the good fortune of being in your offices, absolutely phenomenally well-run business, but was it always prime for sale or did you have to go through a process? And if so, what did that look like? 
No, it was never for sale. My dad passed away in 2003, and I still wonder if he's still mad at me. <laughs> Quite, uh-huh. But th- things change and opportunities. The, we were fortunate enough. I don't know who I heard it from. I don't want to plagiarize anything, but I heard once, you know, half luck, half brains. And just attention to detail. I love attention to detail. Finish the process. We were just fortunate to make some of the right decisions that made it possible to actually sell the company. For example, back in 2002, 2008, 2007 financial crisis where you couldn't get crap. You know, we, unfortunately, we never did financial, audited financial statements. And why mm-hmm. didn't we do it? Because we were a typical smaller business back then. Why do I need those? Well, number one, you need them for any kind of banking relationship. Number two, anybody that's going to buy you, you're not going to sell anything without it. At some points, we got lucky. And that's part of what a good exit transition plan would be is to really seek to professionally manage your business, audited financials or reviewed financials, but one of those things. You and I have shared, I mean, you hired some really talented executive talent over the years. Was there a defining moment where you said, look, I need to get someone, I can't be the smartest guy in the room or my family members can't be the smartest in the room or was it an effort for you to kind of elevate yourself and delegate it to some different leadership and different leadership strengths? Yeah, the biggest thing for us was as we took on these large wholesale accounts, the Walmarts, the Joannes, we needed to be more and more sophisticated and you couldn't have a shipping error. You had to ship to 3,000 Walmart stores. You couldn't make mistakes. And although we had sizable warehouse space, probably a million and a half square feet, we weren't as sophisticated as we need to be. So identifying where you're really bad then trying to find the right professional. We brought in for our warehouse. We found a guy that was out of American Greetings, which is a local Cleveland large company, which all he did was warehouse. So we brought him in. How do we sophisticate that? And then how do we put ourselves in a position where we're ahead of our competition, not only on the product and the sourcing, but on, on how we deliver it, which has become more and more important. I mean, the whole business of logistics is a business in and of itself, right? Correct. And trying to understand that and trying to understand that. Well, it's just a fascinating story and they're very grateful and thankful for that you are willing to share that with us. But let's kind of turn the page a little bit. You're the youngest son of the founder. You've got an older brother, older sister, and a twin sister. But then I know you also had maybe some of your own children perhaps maybe come through the doors throughout the years. I know your, your two sons, uh, Nick and Tony are uh, their own paths now, but at the maximum, how many family members did you have working in the business between Doris and Pat Catans? We had 21 family members. Working, oh my within goodness. My boys, because I required my boys, you got to go out and got to get a different education. You got to get a job first and then we'll figure it out later. Well, the older two became attorneys. The third one worked for Sherman Williams for a while. And then my youngest son is a movie producer. I really pushed them so if something went wrong, and in a family business, a lot of dynamics, I'm thinking to myself, they don't need this right away. They need to figure it out. And then from there, we'll see what happens. 21 family members, and very few of them were years, but you were serving as the president and CEO. So I bet... Just knowing the dynamics of I'm the oldest son in my family. I mean, not that you're the oldest son, you're the second oldest son, but if you're kind of sitting at the head of the table, you're a target for everyone, correct? That's correct. The tough part about a family business, no one's going to believe or think that their children aren't capable of something. The hardest part about my job was that, and I was very strict, that if Family members always can work there. There's no problem with that. But I'm not putting someone in a job unless they fit that role. And I'm not going to promote anybody unless they're capable of fitting that role. Mm -hmm. Because you're just going to ruin the individual. But more importantly, you ruin the regular employees outside of that. And that was the toughest. That was the toughest part. What was your biggest challenge? I mean, it wasn't the financial crisis per se. It might have been kind of just constantly having to juggle the family dynamics, you would you say that weighed on you heavily at times? 
Yeah, because then in life, look, it's, when you're running anything, when you're the CEO of anything or you're running your household or whatever that is, you're paid to put out crises, to fix problems. But then when you throw all the emotion in where your sister-in-law's mad at, your mom's mad because Larry's mad or Harry's mad, mm-hmm. that's a whole different dynamic of stress. I loved crisis management, the 07, 08, you know, we had trouble. We had three different banks. At the end of the day, when we woke up, we had a $150 million line of credit with Wells Fargo. We only had three covenants. It all worked. But when you throw in that stress, is your wife going to be mad at you? Or who's calling this person? It's the drama. Yeah, no question about it. 21 family members. You know, my good friend who's part of our team at Succession Plus US, Chris Goble, I thought he had a lot of family in his business. He has nine brothers, excuse me, eight brothers. He was the ninth at the Lakefront Lines, the 16th largest charter bus company. And I just shake my head. I mean, sometimes you, my brother and I can't even play a round of golf without yelling at each other. I can't even imagine working with 21 family members. But So, Mike, as we look to kind of wind down, this has been awesome. What's the one thing, if you look back, what would be the one thing you'd do differently if you had to do it over again? Probably more patience. But if I'm older, maybe I've gotten more patience. When I say more patience, maybe spend, instead of 15 minutes explaining to the family members why we're doing it, maybe spending 45 minutes. They probably still would have been mad, but maybe that would have, was made a difference, but my personality was always, I'm going to do the business. I'm going to make the decisions for what's best to grow the business. And you lose a lot of friends that way, quite frankly, but you're either going to do it that way. There's no in between, but a family business to throw this point out, but a large family business can work. If everybody's on the same page that who's ever in charge deserves respect, from all those that work there. And mm-hmm. that's it. When you decide to have a leader, your job is to support and follow that leader, not to undermine him every day in, day out, which is what happens. That's great. That old saying, heavy is the head that wears the crown, right? I mean, it's a lot to ask one person to wear the crown. I think that's one of the great things about entrepreneurial relationships is it's very difficult for business owners to share these types of things unless you've been another business owner then you completely get it right but i want to go back and just maybe just reopen this family dynamic what one of the things i just made a note here what type of family governance or corporate governance did you have in place if any i mean did you have board meetings did you have boards of advisors were they listened to or was it was there still a lot of maybe some drama sometimes that you thought hey this will help kind of doused that fire and it didn't well we had all the above and i tried to bring in some quality outside people so i had not a i had an outside person that was our president our cfo so that gave hope to the rest of the employees that were not just going to appoint family members but we i had an outside board everything you talked about we had sometimes they listened to them but most of the time whoever wasn't happy at in those meetings, just kind of explaining their position and why they should do this or why are we doing that. But it, but most family businesses, if people, look, I can have anybody tell me how stupid I am every day. That's fine. As long as you understand what's going on in the business, why we're making the decision. It's not just that you're stupid because you want somebody else to be in charge. Mm-hmm. I had all those in place and I, it helped me. We brought in some good people. We, you know, I pushed through the meetings, even some days I was thinking to myself, why am I doing this? But yeah. it was the right thing for the family and the structure. I can imagine. I mean, just having gotten to know you, I mean, you probably need it as a source of therapy to get other professionals in there to say, Mike, you're thinking about this the right way. Your strategy sound. You made a right decision. Unfortunately, your family probably didn't see it that way all the time. And that's normal. I mean, that's just the way it kind of goes. But that was probably very reassuring, I imagine, emotionally for you to have someone say, no, you're reading the tea leaves right here, right? Oh, correct. And, you know, at the end, we had quality individuals, from you know, big company experience. If I did one thing smart, I stopped and had some good advisors on the outside. I think the biggest mistake was small business, which I consider myself still small business, is you never stop and slow down enough to do like what you're trying to do to help people, Mark, 
and, and I think it, you can't, I can't emphasize enough how much it's needed. Like, look, everybody's answer is, I'm not selling my company. It's not for sale. I'll, I'll never sell it. That's untrue. That's mm-hmm. like saying you're never going to die. Mm-hmm. So if you know someday you may sell it, you better have these things in place. This has been great. Mike, one last question, and then we're, we're going to wrap up here. What advice, and that would be your advice, is to work on your business? Uh, what advice would you have for business owners out there that might be listening? You have to stop, take a step back, stop working for a minute. Don't be afraid to find the right advisors. And number one, I mean, look, everybody's going to need an exit strategy, whether you think you need one or not. If you never use the exit strategy, then that's fine. But if you decide tomorrow you want an exit strategy and you don't have audited financials and you don't have the right people helping you, you got a problem because at that point, you're years away from that. Why not? It's life insurance. You don't use it until you die. So what's the difference? But everybody's too busy. They're going to do it later. I would say stop what you're doing and do it now. Yeah, that's great advice. Ladies and gentlemen, Mike Catan. Again, Mike is the former CEO of Pat Catans and Doris, gentleman that at one time ran a company with 2,500 employees operating in five states uh, and the largest craft wholesaler in America. That is quite a feather in his cap. I think more than anything, uh, probably one of the best community soldiers and givers with an abundance mentality that, that, that Northeast Ohio has seen. So, Mike, I want to thank you very much on behalf of Finish Big. I also want to just take a moment, ladies and gentlemen, to let you know that Finish Big is now sponsored by Succession Plus U.S. Succession Plus U.S. is based in the Northeast Ohio market. We also have offices in Australia, New Zealand, and the United Kingdom. So I want to thank Succession Plus for their involvement in our show. Mike, until we meet again, my friend, thanks for being on the show. Ladies and gentlemen, here's to Finishing Big. Hope you enjoyed listening to Finish Big, the podcast with Mark Dorman, sponsored by Succession Plus. Don't forget to click the follow button to be notified when new episodes become available. Visit our website at www.succession.plus slash US or give us a call at 330-350-5410. The information covered and posted represents the views and opinions of the guests and does not necessarily represent the views or opinions of Succession Plus. The content has been made available for informational and educational purposes only. The content is not intended to be a substitute for professional tax or legal advice. Always seek the advice of your legal or tax professionals with any questions you may have regarding your specific situation.